This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, we continue our look at the financial crisis at Hampshire College, where students have entered the 41st day of a sit-in in the president's office protesting what they fear may be the future closing of their school. In January, Hampshire College President Miriam Nelson announced the board of trustees and senior administrators would seek to merge the school with a, quote, strategic partner. The announcement was followed by staff layoffs in the school's development and admissions offices and the news that the school would not be admitting a full class in the fall. Still with us us are three guests. Margaret Cirillo is professor at Hampshire College. She teaches sociology and feminist studies there, where she's taught for 40 years. She's written a piece for The Nation magazine, which is headlined The Unmaking of a College, Notes from Inside the Hampshire Runaway Train. We're also joined by Dusta Kantav, a senior at Hampshire College, member of Hampshire Rise Up, and joining us on the phone, William Null, a trustee of Hampshire College, a partner in the law firm of Cuddy and Fetter, Hampshire College alum, as is his wife and his son, uh, was a member of Hampshire's third entering class in 1972. Um, we welcome you all back to Democracy Now! Thank you for joining us for part two of this discussion. Um, Desta you. Kantav, you have been uh, um, among the students who are leaving the sit-in at the president's <laughs> office for 41 days now, well over a month. It's one of the longest in um, uh, college history in the United States. Can you talk about w why you decided to take this approach? Um, yeah, well— we, our demands are, um, are around shared governance. We want to have a role in everything that's happening. We, as students and a lot, and the staff and faculty that we've been engaging with all feel um, we've been blindsided and excluded in this whole process. And so by occupying spaces like administrative spaces, like the dean of students' office and the president's office, we are putting ourselves directly in the middle of where all that work is happening. And although the people in the president's office have since stopped coming into work, we find, we, or I feel, and I, I can only speak for myself, but I, I think that we, many of us agree that that, that is a disruption to um, whatever work they're doing and our presence is felt. Uh, William, um, Null, uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you, this whole issue of a, quote, strategic partner that the president has said the college is seeking, uh, are, are you able to talk about, uh, have there been any responses to this? And what would happen, and what would the trustees do if the, the attempt to, uh, uh, to link up with a strategic partner does not happen? So there are several different options that are being explored. Basically, what we're looking at, I mentioned to you, was uh, a $5 million deficit next year and $20 million over the next three years. What we're looking at is how can we um, continue to fund and, and enable Hampshire College to continue as, as an important institution in the United States. We're deeply dedicated to doing that. We need about $30 million in the next three years to be able to do that, and there's some very uh, engaged alum, parents, uh, and donors who are uh, potentially looking to assist in that. And we're also looking at affiliating or merging with another institution. Of course, we have uh, key among our, our goals are preserving this important social justice uh, institution and, and committing to the longstanding values of inclusion, equity, and justice. And foremost, as I said earlier, we're committed to being able to continue the educational experience for these students, which obviously um, the disruption of the, the financial situation has, has sub substantially interfered with, and that's quite unfortunate. The stress and anxiety created by this and the difficulties created by the layoffs is something that none of us ever wanted to confront. But, and, but what about the issue of shared governance that the faculty raised, that if this was such a major crisis, why was the faculty not brought in in attempting to come up with potential solutions uh, rather than announce it uh, first and then uh, begin to consult the faculty? Well, as I've mentioned, last year we had this voluntary separation for 30 people from faculty and staff in order to be able to reduce overhead substantially. 
And and so the, the fact that Hampshire has been year to year living in somewhat precarious financial situation is not new. It's been that way for decades. The the situation of being down 300 students from 2014 is something that is new and, and adds to the problem as well as the national trend of having a reduced number of high school students in the Northeast. And as you know, there are a number of colleges that have closed, which we're not looking to do. We're looking to continue it. But Mount Ida, Newberry College, Green Mountain College, and Southern Vermont College have announced closures recently, and there are others that have sought to merge and affiliate. Back to your question, we're working closely with a number of institutions that have shown interest in affiliating or merging with us. And we're hoping that we're going to get to a point of being able to open that for, for further discussion when we when we get to a point of having information and details to to share. We've engaged faculty and staff, faculty, students, and staff. They're voting members on the Board of Trustees. There are participating members on most of the committees, if not all of the committees, that have been formed to address this financial situation at Hampshire now. Margaret Cirillo, your response? Yeah, um, I would just like to, um, to to explain what it's looked like from a faculty perspective. In the fall, we were invited to be part of what um, the president called a visioning committee, full of the optimistic, upbeat rhetoric of imagining Hampshire for the 21st century. However, in a, in a departure from the traditions not only at Hampshire, which is um, particularly strong in this respect, but of shared governance in all colleges and universities, Participants on the visioning committees were required to sign gag rules, non-disclosure agreements, which was to say that everything was and remains a secret. We have no idea who the potential st strategic partners are. Even those who are on these various committees, and there's a new one every month, no longer elected by <laughs> the constituencies, but increasingly appointed by the president, which really undercuts their legitimacy on campus. So from our perspective, we are dealing with an autocratic, top-down, secretive and non-transparent administration and process that has continually, I would have to say, lied to us or actively deceived us about what um, what their plans are. And given that I've been at Hampshire for 40 years, we, as the presidents and founders who are completely opposed to the current direction and have not been seriously consulted about it, as they have said, our financial underpinnings have always been weaker than our ideals and our ideas, but we have met managed to survive in, in very creative ways over the last 40 years. Every time, if we're down 30 students, that's a financial crisis for Hampshire, but one that we've been committed to figuring out how to address. What's so alarming is that we are facing our 50th anniversary in 2020, which is an enormous fundraising opportunity, a moment when this long-term strategic situation could have become the subject of a major fundraising and reimagining and re-envisioning effort. That effort's been cut off at the knees. And as I, I really have to emphasize, the, the way in which the secretive executive committee and, and administration have been proceeding looks to any um, observers as though what is being merged with our prospective strategic partner is not a college let alone Hampshire College, but real estate. And that's not only my conclusion, it's been the conclusion of every observer. What do you mean? Well, if we eliminate the faculty— Strategic partner, I thought, meant another college coming in and right. Hampshire so merging example, with it. Right. So, for example, what does it mean to merge? UMass, according to the statements from UMass um, officials, is really in need of land. They, they, they have nowhere to expand, and we're down the road. It's obvious that it would be wonderful to acquire some real estate. That's not the same as the, the image of a strategic partnership that would preserve anything of Hampshire's mission. Once the college is decimated, and decimated is not the right word, it's really going to be cut in half in terms of faculty and student by, the, by um, next fall, what is left of Hampshire College? So it's looking to us like this language 
language of strategic merger and preserving the mission is a language that we have to really take, um, we can't take seriously. And since we are cut out, and all of this talk about committees and participation on the board of trustees, that's been longstanding. I mean, the places where even the trustees were blind, many of the trustees were blindsided by the January 15th announcement. So, really, we have no seat at any table where decisions are being made. The only people who have a seat at that table are bound by gag rules of one sort or another. So, I, I, I'm afraid that I, I really have to contest the official narrative. Let me um, read to you about st what some students accuse Hampshire College lacking transparency. The Daily Hampshire Gazette reports, Hampshire has hired the powerhouse PR firm Subject Matter. The paper reports, quote, some in the Hampshire community have raised questions about the college's ties to John Buckley, the CEO, and his firm. Subject Matter works for plenty of corporate titans. Lobbying records show clients that include some of the world's largest corporations, Facebook, Ford, General Electric, Goldman Sachs Visa, for example, but also include groups like Every Town for Gun Safety and Pew Charitable Trusts. Bill Knoll, can you talk about uh, this company's subject matter and this allegation that Professor Cirillo uh, is making about a strategic partner being um, real estate? So the most important thing, as I mentioned, uh, most of the alums, most of the trustees are alums on the board. And, and the mission of the school is critically important to all of us. This is not an interest in, in a land deal, a uh, real estate deal at all. We're, we're focused on trying to continue this institution, which was designed under the making of the college, the, the book that was written before Hampshire first opened, to have a, a student-faculty uh, ratio of 14 to 1, and we're now at 8 to 1. We've got a very real $5 million, looking at $12, $20 million dollar budget deficit. And that's what's motivating everybody to try and do something, to find the money to keep the institution running. I think we can all agree how critically important it is to have an institution dedicated to social justice and critical thinking in this time and age uh, in America and in the world. So we're looking to preserve that. Unquestionably, there have been communications mistakes and things could have been done better. And I understand that, that uh, the loss of, of jobs that's uh, a result of this financial problem that we've got, deficit that, we, that we're facing, is amazingly upsetting. It's, it's, it's uh, shattering to people who built their careers and dedicated their lives to Hampshire College. If there was a way around it, we would look to do that. But what we're looking to do is to preserve the institution and not to sell off land. Nobody is profiting by this. We're looking to do the right thing the right way for Hampshire College. And I'm sure that uh, more inclusiveness would make more people uh, feel as if there's greater transparency. But we've put financial information on the Internet, uh, on our website, for people to review. And it's a very real financial deficit that we're facing. Oh, what about the issue that uh, Professor Cerullo raised about the 50th anniversary being an opportunity to actually uh, perhaps uh, sharply increase the endowment of the college through a major fundraising campaign, and that this kind of cutback just before that uh, really undermines any potential for that? Yeah, good question. I've been on the board for five years. We had started a capital campaign well before that. Most most uh, capital campaigns actually don't announce that they're underway until you're more than 50 percent there so that you can start with a considerable amount of momentum. And we were doing very well. In 26, 2015, we decided to change uh, who we were accepting to the college and to focus on those who would succeed in the rigorous uh, program that we've got. We called it the Thriver Study. And we also went out to try and increase diversity. So we have more people now who are first generation and more people who, are, who identify as people of color than we've had in, in years past. Uh, unfortunately, we hit a point in time where there was a convergence with, uh, as I was saying, demographic shift of fewer high school students. And when we're down 300 students, uh, Margaret Cirillo acknowledged that a loss of even 30 students would be significant to our finances. Well, we had a loss of 300. This is a very real financial situation. It's not something contrived to try and move the school in another place. 
we're all extremely committed to making this all work and, and really quite upset that, that as a result of where we are right now, it means layoffs for faculty and staff. Um, Desta Kuntav, you're a senior at Hampshire College. Talk about why you first went to Hampshire, what your experience has been. Um, well, yeah, I first went to Hampshire because I was really excited about um, about being in a self-directed program, in a program where I got to piece together my education based on my interests and my passions, and that I had a wealth of faculty who—that I would have a wealth of faculty who would be there as my, as my advisors, as my mentors, and to help kind of shape the experience for me. And that was a huge piece of why I chose Hampshire. And, um, it's a little bit about Hampshire, how Hampshire's academic structure works, is that it's it's built kind of similarly to a, a, a thesis-based program, where your first year you kind of have to take general classes, your middle two years you take classes on a focus, and your last year is spent doing a year-long, essentially, thesis project. And in order to do a year-long thesis project, you really need to have faculty who have expertise in what you're studying, who have time and attention to give to you and your project, and to give you mentorship and to help you find resources and to really teach you how to conduct that kind of research because, you know, that takes a lot of it takes a lot of support to, and to do your, that and to learn what that. What is your and major so, and what are you working on this year? Um, I'm my major is kind of a little bit all over the place, but I, I study um, kind of political science and ethics, and then I also study art. Um, but for me, um, preserve it, to, to respond also in this question to what to what William and, and Margaret were saying, I think that this education is totally built by the fact that we have the amazing staff and faculty that we have at our school to support us. And um, laying off 50 percent of the staff and faculty, I would argue, totally disrupts what the institution is, that the institution cannot go on with half of our staff and faculty gone, because how are students supposed to continue to do these self-directed programs? Even now, for the students, for students like me who are currently in their fourth year, our faculty are concerned about losing their jobs, and there's so much going on right now that it is hard for us to focus on our projects. And um, and yeah, it's it's totally you know the uh, I, I, it was either the board of trustees or Miriam Nelson, somebody who said that. Um, that the reason why we couldn't accept an incoming class is because we couldn't guarantee them the education that they paid for. But I would argue anyone who goes to Hampshire right now has been denied the education that they paid for because of this whole mess. Um, yeah. On this issue of what's happening to uh, higher education, um, UMass president, the University of Massachusetts, not so far from where Hampshire is, the UMass president, Marty Meehan, said last week, make no mistake, this is an existential threat to entire sectors of higher education, and New England is, unfortunately, ground zero. We just heard Bill Knoll talking about one school after another in New England that is um, going under. Um, um, that will no longer be there all through, let's see, there's Newberry College, um, another Massachusetts institution announced in December. It'll close at the end of the academic year. Mount Ida College, located outside Boston. Atlantic Union College, outside Boston, announced it would close the College of St. Joseph in Vermont. Nearly closed last year, but said it would keep operating. Um, and it goes on from there. Um, uh, Professor Cirolo, if you can— um, talk about Hampshire in the context of this? Well, yeah, I, I've very recently begun to become much more informed about the broader context of higher education, the liberal arts, so I don't pretend to be an expert. But as I believe the crisis at Hampshire has been largely fabricated, and I'm glad Democracy Now! listeners got a chance to hear the kind of corporate sensitivity training rhetoric about concern for jobs and livelihood and transparency and shared governance on the one hand, while facts on the ground are being created that completely undermine everything that is being said. I, I think that we also have to look um, very seriously at the crisis of liberal arts as a political crisis, another fabricated crisis. 
um, that is something that those of us who practice and believe in liberal arts education have to learn to analyze. And I think that, you know, this has been a long-term attack. It began with the attack on political correctness. I think the current form that it takes is the attack that says that the liberal arts don't produce people who are job-worthy in the current economy, precisely what they are not geared to do. The liberal arts are geared to producing critical thinkers and people who can engage in ethical reflection and undo their own um, positions. That's what our goal is. And those are—it's the production of that sort of um, student that I, I think that a neoliberal economy um, has no interest in. So I think this is a very, is a very political attack. And I think that we cannot under, um, neglect the fact um, of the enormous withdrawal of federal support for higher education, which makes um, us have to rely more on tuition on on donor um, on donors and fundraising than we could on you know federally subsidized education. And I think that's the issue that we have to face as a country: is what kind of education do we want to subsidize? Because this sort of education has to be subsidized. And are we at a point of saying that this kind of critical education is really only for the elites? Is it only the most elite um, private colleges that have huge endowments that are going to be able to provide this kind of education? Well, well, what you raised in terms of, uh, of this issue of the future of the liberal arts is, is equally true for major universities, right. public universities or private universities. As increasingly, the Vocational. liberal arts portions of their curriculum are declining. Engineering, sciences, technology Absolutely. and business are the growth sectors. And in fact, the universities right. divide their schools up into cost centers. That's and if right. you're not making money, Money, because in terms of your enrollments, uh, then you are less in favor, even within larger institutions. So this is, well, as you say, it's a pro uh, the process of the entire neoliberal project uh, on, a, on higher education. It is. And I think that now those of us in Hampshire who've experienced what I've come to think of as a moral shock, because we thought we were insulated from vulture capitalism, and it turns out we're not. I think that now we're ready to join our colleagues across the country in public universities as you say, who have begun to analyze exactly what you said, Juan. And I, I think the alarm has been sounded. It's been sounded for us, and I hope we can communicate more broadly um, that we have to be extremely skeptical of what are presented as reasons that seem to us increasingly to be rationales and opportunities to push through plans that have, um, that have um, a kind of neoliberal market logic to them that undercuts the kinds of values that the liberal arts have, have stood for. <clears throat> Bill Null, I wanted to ask you more about subject matter. Um, uh, just looking at the Gazette reporting, um, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, uh, talking about John Buckley. It says, Buckley has long worked in corporate PR. He ran communications and advertising at the government-backed mortgage company Fannie Mae from 91 to 2001, was executive vice president of communications at AOL 2002 to 2007, served in senior communications roles in three Republican presidential campaigns, Reagan Bush, Jack Kemp's failed bid in 88, Dole Kemp in 96, though he told the Gazette he's no longer a uh, Republican. Um, can you talk more about the PR aspects of what you're doing now and what the role of subject matter is? I don't have personal knowledge about that. Um, what I can say is that one of the most unfortunate things about uh, this very real financial situation is that uh, unquestionably communications could have been better and the way in which we uh, uh, have articulated the situation from January 15th, perhaps on, I'm sure it could have been improved upon. But the bottom line is that we're in in serious financial situation with a five million dollar deficit next year and twenty million dollars over over the next three. We're looking to raise thirty million dollars so that we can move forward and properly compensate faculty and staff and provide for the sort of educational institution. That, that we've been for the past almost 50 years and perpetuate that. Because as you said, uh, liberal arts education in this country, particularly critical thinking, liberal arts education with social justice direction, 
is at serious risk of, of uh, being eliminated. We're, this is a very real crisis for Hampshire College. We're looking to address that seriously with uh, all different cohorts that we've got. We're including faculty, staff, and students, alums and parents, as well as others. And we would very much welcome any sort of financial support that could help us keep this institution viable and moving forward, uh, exhibiting and helping with the strengths that were very well articulated both by Mark. Let me ask Desta Contab before we lose you on satellite if you have a question for um, Hampshire Trustee Bill Null. Um, yeah, I'm just I I'm curious to know um, how the the communication could have been, I'm, I'm interested in that, that, that statement, the communication could have been better, because I don't think that that is accountable to the fact that um, it was completely inconsistent. We were given information about how um, the, the inc we weren't able to accept an incoming class because of potential legislation that didn't even get passed that would hold the accreditation firm to not accrediting the college because of the financial crisis, which was later just to dis discover to not be true, even though that was initially what we were told. Like, all of these—like, you say that the communication was—could have been better, but I, I'm wondering if you can account for some of the specifics of how the communication went wrong. So I think people have misunderstood when we— what we said was the rationale for not enrolling a fall 19 class. Our, our commitment is to the students that are there today and being able to teach them out. There's, there are two different institutions that are involved in regulating um, the, the college. The accreditation from New England, it's Nietzsche. New England, I've got to look at what the acronym is, but I'm not going to spend time with that. Nietzsche. There's, Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Yeah, there's, there's a a requirement that we be able to show that we've got the financial wherewithal to teach out students that we take in over a four-year period. Now, Montada did not do that. Montada accepted a class and then closed. We're, we're absolutely not at a point of closing, but we did not want to take in a class, a first-year class, that, where we were looking at reduced enrollment numbers First year class at hand. Right, but as a but as an institution that is reliant on but as an institution that is reliant on tuition in order to survive, that feels really inconsistent to me what you're saying. There's a to more preserving preserving the financial situation. That, yes. I know that you would think that, that all you do is multiply the number of students by the tuition. But it happens that you don't get the full tuition, and the number of students that we had and the needs that we would have uh, been, been required to meet for those students would have meant that we would have not been revenue positive with, with a class at the size that we were looking at. We felt morally committed and, and I think correctly, ethically ob obligated to take those students who were accepted last year and deferred and to also take those students that we already accepted in early admission. Because as you said, this is this is an important school. It it really delivers a unique brand and form of education. I benefited from it. My wife benefited from it. And my son did, as so many other people, over the past fifty years. It's it's thanks to the, the faculty and staff and the ability of this school to to provide for critical thinking that we want to continue it all. So what I, what was I saying about the communication? It's a very complicated situation that put us in in the place of being three million dollars over the next three years in in the deficit we're not going to be able to pull this out by short-term fundraising it's not likely at all given the trends that we've had in fundraising previously um professor cerullo 30 seconds last word well i i'm glad that you've all been exposed to what one of my colleagues described as perfectly smooth speech 
devoid of meaning that uses the word ethical in almost every sentence. I don't think this was mm -hmm. a communications problem. I think this is a substance problem. And I would just um, underline that a deeper problem, I think, than the loss of students is an overinflated administration. The number of law firms that the college has recently brought on board, including a notorious union-busting firm, the mergers and acquis acquisitions firm that they've employed, and the bloated administration that we are saddled with. Those are all issues that I think um, also ought to be considered when we look at Hampshire's financial situation and its precarity. Well, we're going to leave it there, but we will continue to cover this issue not only at Hampshire, but at other schools, and look at the crisis of education in the United States. We want to thank uh, Desta Kantav, senior at Hampshire College, member of Hampshire Rise Up, Margaret Cerullo, professor of sociology and feminist studies at Hampshire College, where she's taught for 40 years, and Bill Knoll, Hampshire College trustee and alum. Uh, that does it for this segment. If you want to see part one of our conversation, go to democracynow.org. I'm Mimi Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.